Hello and welcome to episode 145 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And hey, I'm James Whittingham. Happy New Year, everyone. This week, I make my clean energy predictions for 2023. And uh, you know what? This year, I'm going to include all the lottery numbers, Brian. Oh, fantastic. We can all get rich. From this day forward, Hyundai will only sell electric vehicles in Norway. Maybe Ford will be next. And we can call them the Fjord Motor Company. Oh, God. Uganda is giving its motorbike owners free electric motorcycles. They were going to give everyone free health care, but Canada got jealous. Apple is looking to heat a small town in Denmark with waste heat from one of its data centers. Now, if only they could harvest the energy from me having to turn off Apple Music, which starts playing by itself for no reason. Why is it doing that, Tim Cook? Yeah, Tim Cook. We'll have all this and more of this 2023 edition of the Clean Energy Show. So it's true. I, I had to delete Apple Music from my iPad. Really? Because it would just start playing on its own and sometimes connected to like you would put in your earbuds mm -hmm. and then it would start playing. And then other times it just starts playing for no reason at all. Um, Have you looked it up? Weird. Any solutions? Uh, I got, I got, yes, I did. I spent, you know, 10 or 15 minutes on it, could not find a solution, gave up, just deleted Apple Music from my iPad and uh, and from my phone, too, because I use a different music app now. It's very weird. Oh, no. Well, that's sad. I've got a, a free Amazon Music three-month uh, trial because oh. I'm using the HD music. And Oh, nice. I wanted it for Christmas because I realized I listen to a lot of Christmas music. Yeah. Uh, not the usual stuff. I try to have mix it up with instrument, instrumental, old and new and... I just sure. we, we have Christmas music in the house, and I realized most of the year I'm not listening to music as much as I am at Christmas time. So I said, "Hey, let's get a three month trial." I have to remember to cancel it though. Because I don't, yeah, do they have Atmos tracks on there? Uh, no. Why not? Why not? I don't know. Why not? I think they do on your phone. Well, yeah. But anyway, someday we will release an episode in Dolby Atmos, I think, just yes. for the fun of it. Yes. I, I don't know what we'll do. We can't even... <laughs> I, 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 I've experimented with stereo, putting you a little bit left and me a little bit right. There's a reason why nobody does that. It's, it's kind of disconcerting. Yeah. Yeah. And often I only list with, with one headphone anyway. Oh, really? I never thought yeah. of that. Well, there you go. Yeah. Why do I bother mixing in stereo then, Brian? It's using up <laughs> bandwidth. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and just an update. So last episode was our big year end spectacular. We talked about all of my uh, travel issues, trying to get back home. Uh, the, the Christmas airports were all messed up. Anyway, I had to postpone the radon mitigation that I had scheduled for my house because we just weren't home in time. So uh, if anyone's following the radon update, it is well, I am. not done yet. I'm following it. Uh, I just got back from the gym not i don't want to clarify that it's not your normal gym it's my a gym at my uh, medical clinic for fat people and people who don't want to go to regular gyms and maybe can't afford it or don't want to go there um so it's something that keeps me alive barely barely but it yeah. keeps me alive mm -hmm. and i was coming home and i turned on the car there because i don't have any heater in the car <laughs> all right your nissan leaf still got a broken heater and uh, i've been accumulating frost on the inside of the window so it's becoming harder and harder to drive <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I turned it on there at the clinic. I parked it in the sun, and uh, the steering wheel didn't work. I don't know if I left my lights on, because last time I went to the gym before Christmas, I left my lights on for some reason. It usually beeps, but maybe I was, I don't know, distracted, or maybe it's somehow the beeping is not working, but I, I, I might have depleted the 12-volt battery somehow, and that might have been the issue. But by the time I got home... You see, it charges the battery when you turn on the car. It's like having an alternator running from your engine when you have a, an electric car traction battery. It will right. start charging the battery and topping it up, and I can actually see that on my app that I third-party app that connects to the computer terminal called LeafSpy Pro, and I saw that it was up over 14 volts, which meant it was being charged. Anyway, got home, turned it off and on again, and it was fine. Turn it off and on again at the gym. So I'm just worried, Brian, because the car's getting long on the tooth, as it were. It yeah. is now officially uh, 10 years old. I, it just occurred Do you know to how me many uh, miles or kilometers are on it? 
Yeah, about 120,000 kilometers, which is what in miles? 80,000, something like that. 80,000 around there, yeah. Because uh, it's a you know it's a low battery car. This was the first generation of Leafs, and even the most recent ones aren't that great for you know uh, range. So people use yeah. them around the city. The people before me probably did, and I do as well. So I've had it for five years, almost five years, but it is a ten-year-old car now, and I've had some some issues with it. But it per turns out that I may have just left my lights on and depleted the 12 volt. A lot of times with electric cars, you have a problem. It's the 12 volt battery that's yeah. That's and the issue. The lights don't turn off on their own, I guess. Well, they are supposed to. When I took it in to get the uh, work done, they said my my 12 volt bat was a bit, battery was a bit low, but I didn't find that. I haven't found that. Yeah. So I don't trust those bastards. They, they might have left it on for a long time and then said it was low. <laughs> I don't know. Or, you know, I can't trust anyone. Can't trust anyone these days. 2023. Uh, I, Brian, I need to apologize to you. Um, uh, I partial, it's partially your fault for trusting me, but I told you to go buy Tesla stock. And I think it's oh. fallen about 30% <laughs> since you did. And I feel horrible about that. Um, yeah. I'm sure well, it'll go that, up. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about money and investing uh, later in the show. But that, James, that's your first lesson in how the stock market works, which is <laughs> never as you think. Never as you think and don't go on, on logic and don't give investment advice to friends. However, the thing <laughs> keeps falling so much. I was thinking, geez, at what point do I mortgage the house and buy Tesla stock, you know, because yeah. it's, uh, it's pretty cheap. We, also, we may be at that point. But yeah, the, so that was a couple of weeks ago. And... Um, Elon Musk had released that poll about should I step down as a Twitter head and, and the vote was yes. And so your theory was, oh, okay, well, the stock's going to go up the next day. So I, I bought 10 shares. That, it was only 10 shares. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's way down since then. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to go up eventually. <laughs> eventually. Eventually. But yeah, I mean, it's getting to the point where I think it's still like 10 times what it was in 2019 when I was thinking of buying it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you should have bought it then when I had some money. But, yeah, what are you going to do? Got a toaster yeah. for Christmas, Brian. Wow. Yeah, it's not up to the uh, level of your toaster. You have a very high-end <laughs> toaster. An elitist yeah. toaster, if you will. Uh, one that goes up and down on its own. But mine, yeah. mine has a feature that is just made for James. I, I love having my toast hot, okay? Okay. So I will eat one slice of toast. Sure. And I'll... Just, I won't. I'll leave the other one in there to stay warm. With sure. this toaster, it allows me to do that. It does not pop up. You can have the keep warm function, and it will beep when it's done. But it will keep the toast down in the chamber, wow. and it will cycle the chamber on and off every thirty seconds to keep heating it and not burning it. So, and it does that for about three extra minutes. Technology is changing the world, James. And I found a way to, to use even more electricity. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that I keep keep finding ways to use more electricity, which is not what you want to do necessarily. Um, yeah. But I'm quite happy with it. It's just it's deluxe, and uh, yeah, I, it just keeps the toast warm, and and that's what I want. I want warm toast. People, yeah. half the audience is saying toast. You shouldn't eat toast. Well, you know the Beatles ate toast, and look what happened to them. Yeah. We're the toast Beatles of uh, clean energy podcasting. We eat toast. So I've been car shopping still, and you know what? The yep. it, the year ended, and I was looking at the Chevy Bolt, one of the cheapest uh, uh, EVs you can buy in Canada, and it, it no longer has 10 years of free connectivity. So the connectivity allowed you to use your app for 10 years instead of being charged 150 or something a year or monthly or whatever. So it gave 10 years of connectivity, and that's gone now. So what... Hmm. What few people were able to buy a car prior to this now can't get that anymore. So I'm pissed off about that. And that is, was a selling point to me. It was a bit of a selling point. Yeah. So I've, I'm losing selling points here. And I'm actually starting to look at other cars. Uh, if the, the VW ID4 is probably the next priced car if you don't include the Leaf. And it, mm -hmm. it kind of has a Leaf range in their lower spec version. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot more than a Leaf. I mean, you get that heated windshield. Oh, I want that heated front windshield. I've never had one before. It seems like such a wonderful thing. God, I wish I had one. Imagine if I had one in the Leaf, I wouldn't have my frost problems. Even yeah. if the heater didn't work, I wouldn't have frost problems on my front window, right? I mean, it would be divine. 
Absolutely divine. Um, you know, in the U.S., though, they've dropped the price by 6000 um, recently, but since they're going to get the tax credit again, they've upped it by a few hundred dollars, not less than $1,000. So, I mean, you're going to get 7500 off, whereas you weren't getting anything before. And so now it's, that's really good though, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's a the really good deal. still kind of the best deal in electric cars. And a lot of people like them. Like uh, Electric yeah. did a nice uh, love uh, letter to the Bolt and said that it was a great car and a great value. Uh, I don't know, though. I don't know. Because uh, they, they're they not coming down where we live in Canada. And that's kind of a pisser to me. Like, uh, in fact, there's not that many available. And I see it as there's going to be a lot less available because... Um, you know, the tax credit in the States. If they weren't selling enough mm. of them as it was, they're going to sell even mm. more now. I guess there was a big lineup to get in line to buy them and people are fighting each other in line. Uh, the, wow. the Actually, the electric um, website uh, quoted something that I saw myself. You know how I'm on these electric forums on Facebook? Yeah. yeah. They quoted something that I'd already seen. It was like, yeah, everybody's, that's the place to be. It's your Facebook um user groups for these different automobiles it's before you buy them so you can see mm -hmm. what problems people are having what solutions they are you really get a sense of what these things are like when winter comes you find out how people struggle mm -hmm. and, and what what issues they have we're going to talk lots more about that later so the, the new bolt in the u.s starts at 26.5 that's up 900 dollars from its previous base price and the euv the slightly larger uh car got uh, is up by 600 dollars only um to the base price of twenty seven eight hundred. Oh man, that's a thousand dollars more. It's thirteen hundred dollars more. The UV is. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like a bigger car, but a lot of people say the the regular Bolt handles better. Yeah. So the price comes just a few days after the Bolt regained its eligibility for the U.S. federal EV tax credit. As I said on the last show, check yeah. to see what those are because they're they're they haven't set the. They haven't finalized what they're going to do for, you know, you have to have it built in the United States. It has to have minerals in the United States. Yep. They haven't figured that out yet, but they will in March. So, you know, if you're looking, Tesla's not really affected. I don't Or are they? Yeah, some of their models are affected. I take that yes. back. Some actually, qualify. And as we mentioned before, also, you know, rebates for things like heat pumps in the U.S. are starting on uh, January 1st. So right when we did our year in spectacular, which was a 90 minute show because uh, you were late and and we didn't have time to do another show for the end of the year, um, the U.S. experienced a ridiculous cold snap, a weather bomb, if you will. And mm -hmm. everybody was out testing their EVs. They didn't normally have a chance to get down to minus 30 in places like Denver. So there was lots of people testing their cars there and... It's frustrating, but there was a story on national news that said, you know, Tesla owners' holiday ruined because uh, they couldn't charge their car. And of course, you know, if my car, if if my, um, you know, if I had an SUV, a gas-powered SUV that didn't start, it wouldn't make the national news. You know, <laughs> I mean, come on, it's just <laughs> stupid how these things work. Like, so, he either yeah. didn't know how to use it, or he had a problem with his car. Not a national news story. It's like saying it's it's like racism. It's like one one of these things does not make all of them the same. Yeah, you know, you, you just can't do that, and it's it's frustrating. But you know, it was interesting because out of spec reviews, the channel that I watched, I mentioned it on the show. Um, he uh, t been doing a lot of EV testing. A lot of these guys, like our friends over at um, what's our uh, at uh, straight pipes. straight pipes, they found that people are watching more videos about electric cars. Because there's a research element involved yeah. and a new technology thing. So they, a lot of these people have started with combustion cars are now largely focusing on EVs when they can. And uh, this guy mm -hmm. is one of them. So, yeah, he, he put a leaf out, a, a leaf slightly worse off than mine, a, a year older and uh, a, one less bar of battery. So... The battery is in a little bit worse of shape, but he put it out there at 40% and left it at a charging station, by a charging station for two days, and the temperature was headed down to minus 30 Celsius or minus, I don't know, 27, 25 yeah. Fahrenheit. Very cold, very cold for, for Denver. In fact, some of their coldest days ever. So 
Yeah, and it did not start. And it turns out it was the 12-volt battery. Long story short, short and it was yeah. a very long story because it took several days of <laughs> trying to get it to charge and it would not accept the charge. But it wasn't... Uh, yeah, and there was no temperature on the battery. And what I've learned, Brian, <laughs> long story short again, is that the Leaf is one of the best winter cars in the world, EV wow. or otherwise. Because... I, I didn't realize this when I did my presentation. I thought all cars heated their battery to keep them usable, and they don't. When he plugged in a Tesla, it took an hour before it would charge. When he, he cold-soaked a Tesla in that weather, yeah. and it wouldn't accept a charge, it, what it did is it's, it put a bunch of electricity at the supercharger into heating the battery, preconditioning the battery, yeah. getting it up to a state where it's not going to be hurt. But it's, you know, there's less resistance in a battery, which is why you want to keep it above minus 20. Or a lithium ion battery, usually minus 20 is where they keep it, is where the, the leaf keeps it. Well, my leaf, you know, it's out there heating that battery kind of like a, a battery blanket would uh, in, in the heating, you know, in the battery compartment where the uh, modules are. And it keeps it at a usable state until it hits 20% state of charge. So that leaf had no state of charge and wasn't working and they had to push it and then they had to change the battery. Once they changed the battery, the, mm -hmm. the 12-volt battery, just the little 12-volt battery, and they worked fine. Perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah, so um, electric cars, they still use a regular 12-volt battery. Is there any uh, that don't? Is there, uh, I can't uh, remember. Well, Tesla has moved to a lithium-ion uh, battery right. on their newer cars. But it's still it's a 12 volt system to run the stuff in the car. Basically, it turns on the computer, you know, operates the um, the uh, the car while you're not there. If it's you know, sentry mode and things like that. But it gets topped up by the traction battery, which is big. It's, yeah. it's like I said, it's acting as the alternator on a uh, gas car. Yeah. So another interesting test that blew my mind. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it because I, I got mixed vibes from you when I told you about this. The when they were unplugged, the they had a, a Model Three like yours with the resistive heater, which is like the one that yeah. doesn't work in my Leaf. You just had yours replaced under warranty, and they did one with the heat pump. Now I was kind of skeptical about the heat pump working at minus thirty because mm -hmm. they don't do great to minus, um, you know, well whatever, yeah. minus fifteen below. Sometimes it depends on the heat pump. Well, Tesla has figured that out. I was really impressed. Uh, they use waste heat from the motor. They'll run the motor, apparently, without going mm -hmm. anywhere to create waste mm -hmm. heat. And they'll take the waste heat from the motor. So even if, you know, they don't have a backup resistive heater, but they still worked. And it outdid, the, the test was a bit questionable, but they outdid the resistive heater. It, it heated the car in yeah. 36, meter, 36 minutes. Well, I have a clip. Let's just... Let's pay it, clip it. And right around the 36 minute mark, we have reached 70 degrees here. Um, what I'm actually really curious about is let's go see where the other car is at. So 36 minutes, I would say it's officially hot with direct heat on me. What I'm gonna do is I actually, I just moved it slightly away from my face because I was starting to sweat. I'm gonna keep climb it on on high and keep let it do, letting it do its thing. So let's see. What, what happens, but let's just pop out here and have a check on Alyssa and hear some of the noises. You can hear the heat pump going. It spun down a little bit as I got out. So let's go check on Alyssa and see what the temperature is in here. I'm really curious. We're at 70 degrees. Wow, significantly colder in here. It was only like 45 degrees or something, it, which was better than minus you know something but yeah yeah so yeah it is super interesting of course you would think the resistive heater would heat up faster and work better because it's just it's like a hair dryer it's just kind of instant heat the heat pump is a little bit more um convoluted but it's always seemed with my car that the software i think is often limiting how much heat you get from the heater the software is trying to protect the range that you've got left in the car. That's just my theory. I don't really have no idea how it works, but sometimes it feels like there should be more heat coming out of the heater than there is. And I assume that that's the reason why. So a lot of heaters, a lot of these resistive heaters are 7,000 watts. In the Mach-E, 
the Ford Mach-E, which I'm, I'm just going to talk about some of the more popular cars around, affordable and popular. Uh, it's only 5,000 and then people are, I see are complaining about that. They say that's not enough. Oh yeah. That's not enough. It should be <laughs> 7,000. Uh, yeah. so if you are heating that big, you know, 12, 1500 pound battery, uh, it takes a while to get warmth into those cells. And although it can, when you precondition it, it does it fairly fast, I guess, but, um, it takes a lot of energy. You, it, it, it's a fluid loop, and it's not like my car where it's a battery blanket. It's a fluid loop. So you're you're mm -hmm. heating up this fluid and putting it through the battery, uh, the same fluid that would cool it if it was too hot. And, yeah, you're warming it up. So that takes some energy. It takes 7,000 watts for your heater. And then you got to say, well, what's left over for the car? Because uh, you can't suck everything out of the battery all at once. So you, and it doesn't want you to think that the car is performing poorly, right? It's going to want to have yeah. all of its performance in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that Leaf, it's not a great car for, for range and some other things, but uh, man, it's uh, I, I'm giving it a top grade for, for winter. Like it's, I've used it, if you watch videos on our YouTube channel, I've got stuff there where I'm minus 42 starting it up and and, you know, it was preheated at the time um, by on a timer that was built into the dash. And it just, it's a, hot, hotter than my new toaster, Brian. Hotter than my new mm -hmm. toaster. It's just very warm. So, yeah. And, and <laughs> some, some of these cars, I'll get to them later, but they're just, uh, they're just not doing well. So some cars, you know, it, it does become trickier in the winter and they're all a little bit different. Uh, the, the heat, the way the heat they get the heat. I'm sure there's some cars with heat pumps that aren't doing what Tesla's doing. You know, they're not finding waste heat uh, within the system, the computer and the uh, the motor, and then using it. So maybe they're not working, or maybe it's not very efficient at those temperatures. It's working constantly. We'll see. I don't know. So that was interesting um, to find out. Yeah. Uh, okay, so just to follow up on Norway, we love talking about Norway because, of course, they are the world leaders in adoption of electric vehicles through the uh, incentives that they have in place for that. Uh, anyway, Hyundai announced that they will no longer sell any internal combustion vehicles in Norway as of January 1st, a couple of days ago. And that includes plug-in hybrids. They just decided to dump it all. So wow. EV only in Norway for Hyundai as of a couple of days ago. Which and is we great. don't know why, do we? Because uh, there's a scramble on in Norway right now because they're going to actually get rid of some of their EV incentives. Mm -hmm. And there's a scramble for people to, to buy the cars now and get them. <laughs> and there's been some availability problems. So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we'll talk about it on another show another day, but... Norway has reached 90% roughly vehicles with a plug of new car sales. Uh, new cars sold, yeah. Yeah, and that's really good, and that's basically the top of the S-curve, right? Because the, the S-curve in adoption, once you hit 90%, it sort of levels off again. Well, that's where they are, and they have been leveling yeah. it off for a while. But they want to encourage, uh, you know, they want to encourage not using a vehicle now. They've reached to the point where, okay... We've got the electric vehicles. Now we want to encourage not using any vehicle or yeah. not buying vehicles and not, you know, in yeah. treating the environment in that way. So that's interesting as well. So they're encouraging walking yeah. and biking and busing. For sure. And they have, you know, a fairly clean electricity grid in Norway, which is great. Um, and they do have a lot of oil and gas, but it's mostly exported, um, which is interesting. And, and uh, we'll see how they deal with that in the future. Oh, oh, I'm going to talk a little bit about battery heaters, okay? Because I, I did some work this morning. I didn't have a lot of time to do this before the show was recorded. But here we go. Uh, battery heaters and popular EVs. The Leaf has a battery heater. Uh, that's This is when you're not plugged in. They all have battery heaters, okay? But this is when you're not plugged in. Yes, the Leaf will, will keep your battery warm down to 20% charge. Then it doesn't want to hurt the battery, so it turns off. Uh, and then you may not get your car started. So that's an issue too. Um, you may not be able to start that leaf until it either warms up a bit or you're able to plug it in. So it's good to be able to plug in cars when you live in cold climates. And I am open to any information our listeners have. If you live in a cold climate and you're driving something 
in an EV, let us know how it's going or how it went during that cold snap in uh, the northern half of the states. Um, it's a bull and it's typically not a problem for people who have a driveway and you can plug it in at home, but there are people who live in apartments with EVs. So in cold climates, that is a bit more of an issue, um, you, you know, if you don't have a place to plug it in every night. This is what I'm learning, Brian, that it is an issue for people who don't have a you know, if you live in an apartment, you have to park in the street, or if you park in the driveway, even if you park in a driveway, like the apartment I had always had a 110 uh, volt plug for um, yeah. block heaters in cold climates. In the parking lot, yeah. In very cold climates, you have that. And I could have charged, I mean, you, you don't charge very much doing that, but you can at least keep your battery warm. Or if you go to work, yeah. you know, oftentimes there's battery... Um, They'll cycle on and off, unfortunately, at a lot of businesses. And I wish they would change that. I wish they would have a, a row of, you know, receptacles that would not cycle on and off for EV owners to uh, constantly maintain and get a, a bit of their charge. Basically, what if they do cycle on and off, you're not gaining more than a kilometer or two during your workday. It's all going mm -hmm. to keeping the battery warm. That's what I've learned. And if you guys have any, you know, contrary uh, information, send it in to us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We'd love to hear about your cold weather experiences. Uh, my buddy bought a Ionic 5 from Hyundai, and I don't have any information from him yet, but when plugged in, um, it will heat the battery, but not when it's not plugged in. And it says the it may not work below minus 35. It says that in the manual. I downloaded the manual, read the manual. That's not good. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't yeah. often get below minus 35, even where we are. The Yeah. One of the happens. coldest populated places on the planet, but it does, and you want it to work in the worst case scenario, right? Like I said, the Mach-E has a 5,000 watt resistive coil heater, and people are saying it needs more. So maybe maybe Ford will adopt that. I don't know how the, the F-150 uh, Lightning is. Uh, if it's, you know, I wanted to look into that too, but I haven't, there's obviously a lot less samples of that around for people to talk about. Um, the Tesla Model 3 is not automatic if not plugged in. Is that correct, Brian? I guess. I mean, I always have it plugged in every night when it's cold, so, you know. But you've done I, some I winter trips night. to hotels. You've always had charging at the hotel that's always worked out for you? Yeah, yeah. I tend to book hotels that have charging. With so level 2. Have you ever run into a problem doing that? Uh, no, it's always worked. It's, um, you know, sometimes you've got to share. There's only one charger, and you have to share it with somebody, but it's worked out. Oh, Okay. Well, Tesla recommends activating climate settings at least 30 to 45 minutes before departure. So that will heat up your battery and your cabin. It, th these things do take a bit of time in electric cars, uh, yeah. even though they are, you know, quite hot. They blow hot air yeah. right away. And I would say, like, I use about twice as much battery juice in the, in the car in the winter than I do in the summer. Like, it's a lot more. Is that right? But you're not skipping yeah. on heating yourself or anything like that. So yeah, you have... preheat the car and everything, but basically drain the battery twice as much in the winters than I do in the summer. As you drive, you have 50% range. Does that equate to 50% range or are you just saying all the preheating and things? Yeah, like in the summer, like I charge to 90% every night. So in the summer, I might drive around the town and, and be at 70% at the end of the day. But in the winter, it'd be down to like 50%, 40%. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, yeah. It, it took an hour for the uh, out of spec uh, thing to do that, to, to get the car heated up. But um, warm enough to charge. Generally, it. if you know what you're doing, and you do have to adapt with electric cars in cold weather a little bit and understand the differences, but generally, they, they're not going to let you down. You know, mm -hmm. as I've said many times on the show, I've during cold snaps, I go by uh, people getting towed. Yeah. They're not EVs. They're they're all they're uh, you know they're they're, they're tr trucks in some cases, big vehicles that uh, uh, are not starting. So yeah, yeah. It's it's and those twelve volt batteries they always tend to fail when it uh, you know if the battery is in decent shape you can drive through the summer. But if your battery is a bit iffy and as soon as it's minus thirty, that's when you figure out that oh crap, I need to replace that twelve volt battery. Uh, okay, so uh, a story I don't like to report on because I don't like to give anyone ideas, but we've mentioned this before. There's been these substation attacks in the U.S. 
And uh, there was another one, this time in Washington State. So previously it had been down in uh, North Carolina. Um, so, yeah, people are attacking power substations uh, with a little bit of regularity now, which is a little bit alarming. There are places that are not typically all that secure, I guess, you know, uh, uh, in the, in the well, this one was because they caught them right away, didn't they? Yeah. You saw them on a camera and caught them? Yeah, they had to snip some wires to get in a, a fence or something like that. But apparently the goal was a heist. They were going to pull a heist. They wanted well, we, the power to be out. We really talk about heists on our show. <laughs> they wanted the power to be out so they could uh, pull off a heist. So it, it wasn't any kind of, you know, domestic terrorism kind of thing. It was just, uh, it was a heist. Yeah. You know, like uh, Ocean's Eleven, one of them where they set off that thing that knocks out all the power. Yeah, that but kind you don't of thing, really but, think of a substation. Yeah. But essentially, yeah, you're, they're, 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 what do they do? Go up a telephone pole or something and kill a capacitor or something? I yeah. can't remember, but... Something like something that. Something like that. All right. Well, let's get on with the show. Uh, okay. So a couple of episodes ago, you asked me about uh, who are the biggest heat pump manufacturers because we've discussed on the show even since we started the show uh, almost three years ago heat pumps are now part of the uh, everyday vernacular they've they've really taken off in popularity uh, driven in part by uh, Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine um, everybody's trying to get off fossil fuels and heat pumps are a great way to do it so you mentioned a couple episodes ago well what are the biggest heat pump manufacturers that might be a good investment so um, the thing is I looked into it. So there's a list here. So the, the biggest heat pump manufacturers, Mitsubishi, Carrier, Danfoss, Daikin, and Johnson Controls. Those are kind of the, the biggest ones. But all those companies, they make many, many different things. They don't just make heat pumps. Right. So uh, it is probably still a decent investment because we think heat pumps are going to take off. But, um, you know, who knows? Mitsubishi might be um, mismanaging other parts of their business. You know, you never, you got to do your due diligence and really yeah, kind of... yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't just say this is good because they're getting in the heat pumps and it's going to save their company. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this though. What you, you've ordered your heat pump, right? Uh, have not technically ordered it. I've, I've got to get on that this week. But you've you've picked it out. You understand that you're going to put a huge, you're going to yeah, pay for the whole thing. Just waiting for a meeting with my HVAC guy. And so what brand is yours? Oh, um, yeah, I forget. You forget? Oh, no. <laughs> I want a link. I was going to ask you for a link. No, is we'll, there a link? We'll talk about it once we get it ordered and stuff. Okay. Well, I, I want a link. I want to see what it is. I, I do know that uh, a few months ago, the Department of Energy in the States uh, was giving out awards to anybody who comes up with a, um, a better heat pump. Mm. And I can't remember it was Carrier or Lennox. It was one of the furnace companies that came up with a better heat pump, and they received an award and recognition for that. Wow. Um, but unfortunately, I, I, for some reason, I thought it was Lennox. Yeah. I mean, it could be. Or Carrier. Perhaps Carrier. So one of the furnace manufacturers. But anyway, so that's some of the heat pump manufacturers, which leads us into a seldom used segment on the show. It's time for Brian's Book Report. <laughs> Book report. We so, played it twice, the book report intro, because you said you would never use it again. Yeah, well, Here you know, we are, mere I, weeks later. I, I'm not a big fan of reading books. It's uh, it's, <laughs> it's too hard, reading books. So, That's out there now on the internet, you know, that quote from you. Well, when You I can't do, run for office now. <laughs> you've limited your life. I'm not a big fan of reading books. Well, when I do read them, it tends to be audio books. So, it, in fact, this was the audio book. That's not reading. That I listened to. Um, I think it counts. But anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, this sort of... So, we were talking about the, the Tesla investment earlier. Clean energy is not necessarily an investment story, but like your point about heat pumps, it's like, hey, that might be a good investment, companies that make heat pumps. Um Clean energy is also an investment story. Like the entire world economy, as we know it, and as we predict here on the show, is shifting from a fossil fuel-based economy to a clean energy economy. So all kinds And it's of... really taking off now. Yeah. Like it's, we, we talked about this when we started the show nearly three years ago, but now we're seeing it. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. No, and we always kind of plan to do the show to 2030 because so much we think is going to happen by 2030. A lot of this transition... 
uh, we think will take place by 2030. But anyway, so I wanted to talk about this amazing book I read called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And it's not about clean energy in any way, but it's a book about the psychology of money. And it's um, really fascinating because if you think about it, every person you know has a different relationship to money because we all... God knows I do. Yeah. We all grow up in a different household. We all have different first experiences. And you know, it's not just if you're rich or poor, but you know, how money is handled in your in your house or in your life. And, you know, there's 8 billion people on the planet and we all have this different relationship to money. So his point in the book is really that finance is often taught as a mathematical skill. You know, you got to learn accounting and spreadsheets and stuff. And, and that is, of course, part of it. But really, it's more of a soft skill. It's, you know, being good with money is 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 a much more intangible thing that has to do more with psychology than than uh, than math probably but um yeah i just wanted to talk about it because clean energy it is kind of a uh, an investment story i think it, you know i think betting on clean energy in terms of investment is probably a darn good idea for the next little while but um so i got a couple of quotes here from the book there's a whole section that again nothing to do with clean energy but i thought it related he's talking about like the wright brothers and the invention of flight and stuff like that, and how essentially people didn't believe it, right? Like, you know, for a long time, people didn't believe it was possible to fly, and even after the Wright brothers flew, didn't think it was possible. And it kind of feels like that's the moment that we're at with clean energy. Like, people just don't believe it. It's like, well, we got to have fusion in order to survive this. We've got to have nuclear, uh, whatever. So anyway, so I'm going to read a quote here um, about the Wright brothers. Several years went by before the public grasped what the Wrights were doing. People were so convinced that flying was impossible that most of those who saw them flying around Dayton, Ohio in 1905 decided what they have seen must have been some trick without significance. Somewhat, as most people today would regard a demonstration of, say, telepathy. It was not until 1908, nearly four and a half years after the Wright brothers' first flight, that experienced reporters were sent to observe what they were doing. Experienced editors gave full credence to these reporters, excited dispatches, and the world at last woke up to the fact that human flight had been successfully accomplished. Four and a half years from when they first flew, um, people started treating it like it was a real thing. Um, so another quote here, the Washington Post wrote in 1909, there will never be such a thing as commercial aerial freighters. Freight will continue to drag its slow weight across the patient earth. And the first cargo plane took off five months later. And this is how much people, I think, are missing the clean energy story in much the same way. It just, um, it doesn't seem possible. And we default to what we have these preconceived notions about it. You know, of course, we've got to keep burning fossil fuels uh, to make everything work. For me, money burns a hole in my pocket. If, <laughs> if it's there, it's got to be spent. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, I've got some extra money uh, a few years ago. So I bought a, a, a movie projector because I really love movies. And I really, yeah. really enjoyed buying that projector and screen. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, I could be dead tomorrow, you know, like <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to enjoy it, which is true. Yeah. yeah. And yet I know people like I have relatives who were penny pinchers and became millionaires off of modest salaries because they pinched every penny. Yeah. And then their children are like that too. They they can't they they've inherited that money. The pe yeah. previous people couldn't take it with them. They've inherited that money, but they're the same as their parents and they can't bring themselves to buy anything. They'll spend countless days looking at something and thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Um but they won't go out and buy it. Yeah. Like they just can't make that commitment to spend the money even though they've got more money than they could possibly know what to do with. Yeah. And they're not going to live forever. They're older than I am. So I, I don't understand people like that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's several things going on. The, the, I mean, the first is that people don't make enough money. I mean, you know, um, salaries have not kind of kept up with our um, e expanding lifestyles. You know, everybody's houses are bigger than they used to be. Everything is yeah. sort of bigger than it used to be. Um, and, you know, used to be able to survive off one income in a family. And, you know, that's kind of a... But I don't know, a lot of these concepts also are very, very new, which I thought was the interesting thing about this book. Like the whole idea of saving for retirement is at most 
two generations old. Like prior wow. to World War II, you worked until you were dead. Like that's how new this concept is. Yeah. So we're only a couple of generations of having to figure out all this stuff about saving for retirement. You know, it's no surprise that, that people uh, struggle with it. And a lot of the kind of mechanisms that we have for doing this. So in America, it's the 401k is the thing used to save for retirement. In Canada, it's an RRSP. Those things have really not been around that long, like since the 60s and 70s. And, uh, and yet everybody's kind of supposed to understand how this works. And the other recent example is student loans. Like it's only been uh, a couple of generations where people have been having to get here in North America into massive debt uh, to go to university. So like a lot of people are, are realizing too late that, oh, maybe I shouldn't have gotten, you know, $100,000 in debt for an arts degree. <laughs> but again, you can't really blame them because it's like something that their parents didn't even have to think about. Like this is all very, very new. So it's no mistake that we can't figure it out. Okay. And you, you never discovered any companies that you could want to invest in. Like I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. Do our listeners have any ideas? Not that I have the money to do it, but, you know, clean energy show at yeah. gmail.com. You know, we'd like to hear from you if you think there's a good investment. I think, I think school buses, I think there's a huge, huge opportunity in the United States that bill the IRA is so huge yeah. Yeah. that, you know, they're, they're putting school buses everywhere, the city buses and uh, charging infrastructure. You know, speaking of the auto spec guy, he was at um, the the show in uh, CES in, not to be confused with us, in Las Vegas, the, the Consumer Electronics Show. And when yep. you and I started our show, we, we covered it a little bit. And there was like an EV or two there, mostly outside because they were showing off yep. their infotainment. That's all it is. There's a yeah. whole wing of it that is, that's all there is, is EVs and charging and, and electric tractors and... Uh, it's just incredible how much that has happened, and and this is really taking off. So the, there's a lot of different charger manufacturers, but those people are going to be putting up, you know, countless chargers across the the continent. Yeah, their cars are moving from you know transportation into being now consumer electronics. Um, yeah, which is of course where the world is going. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, I just don't know what to invest in. I don't know, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking like Lion Electric or something like that mm -hmm. would be a good place. I don't know. Have you considered it? Have you done any research or are you too busy in your retirement? Yeah, no, not, not specific enough to do that. But yeah, in general, clean energy companies should be a good investment. Fossil fuel, the, the you know, fossil fuels as an investment has still been doing okay, which is weird. But, you know, at some point it's going to drop off a cliff. So, uh, you know, who knows? Yeah, and you know, we're, this is our first show back after the Christmas season in North America, and that's when we get to see all of our relatives. And uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm constantly amazed how stupid people are. You know, like I... Don't use your relatives as the guide for everybody. No, but <laughs> <laughs> obviously, I come from a long line of stupid people. But uh, it's just, you know, the people who are not paying attention, it takes some effort to pay attention. It takes some yeah. time and investment to to look at this stuff. I know a lot of people are interested in what we talk about, but they don't have the time to really get into it. So they have no idea. No. And, and also, again, from that book, The Psychology of Money, you know, negative stories tend to get more traction than positive stories. He talks about that a lot in the book where, you know, if somebody paints some kind of doomsday scenario for the economy, it can run on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But, you know, in fact, there's been nothing but mostly good news stories in the last few decades. But, you know, that stuff is, I, I don't know, much harder to get on the front page of uh, of the Wall Street Journal. So did you listen to the book or read it? I listened. It was, yeah, audiobook. Okay. Was it by, was the author reading or was someone else? No, somebody else. And it was decent, but um, they didn't cut out like the mouth sounds and stuff. Oh. Like you, you could hear the, the reader like, you know, licking his lips and <laughs> breathing and stuff. So I thought that was kind of weird. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have my predictions for 2023, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I'm going to get into them. I, I believe, you know, heat, heat pumps were the term of 2022. Uh, but I think the term this year that we're going to talk about is battery belt. Do you know yeah. what a battery belt is? That is the belt that runs from the Great Lakes down to uh, around Georgia. 
and you can see them, all the battery mega factories popping up on some of those. And that's a, those are all mostly flyover states, as they say. So those are red states having huge jobs from, you know, green investment. And they are not going to want that to go away. And it's, it's just exploding. It's, it's just the more, you know, money that goes into it, uh, they just can't make these factories fast enough. So there's all kinds of these gigafactories making, um, and there's some in Canada too, but making this stuff. So it's going to be a uh, battery belt you're going to hear term. Um, I believe that fleet electric vehicles are going to explode this year. Uh, they, they make a really good case, economic case right now, right? Like um, short haul EVs. Uh, there's all these, these, you know, Amazon delivery vans and things like that. Those kinds of things that don't leave a metropolitan area uh, are really jumping on the EV bandwagon. So are rental car companies, as, we, as we've talked about. And that is continuing. And plus Uber and Lyft have incentives for drivers to buy EVs that make it very... Well, if you do that, you just you're increasing your income. If that's your main job, yeah. or even if it's like fifty percent of your main, you know, if you work like fifty percent of a full time hours at that, you can still buy an electric car like a Bolt and and make more money doing it with the Bolt, thanks to the incentives and thanks to the lower cost of electricity. So, the you know, when people own a fleet of vehicles, they're a company and they want to save money, and if you they. They're doing that by buying fleet vehicles, you know, delivery vans, um, small trucks. It's all, even semis that go short distances are becoming electric. And that is going to take off this year. I guarantee you that. It's going yeah. to explode. And that's going to probably outpace uh, consumer EVs, I think, because the consumer EVs are still having a hard time having availability. I think it'll be easier to get a Tesla, it looks like, this year, don't you think? Mm hmm than it was last year. But as far as other people are concerned, they're still kind of out of stock. I think that GM will be slow to get new models out. Um, yeah, and the, the Blazer is supposed to come in the summer and the Equinox, the cheaper one in the fall. You know, by the way, that Blazer is it's more expensive, but it's got really good horsepower and stuff and all-wheel drive. So it'll be a heck of a, yep. heck of a vehicle. It'll compete with the Model Y and other... SUVs, smaller SUVs. I think demand will outpace supply in the United States because the tax rebates there are going to increase, you know, EV purchases a lot. I think two-wheeled EVs will continue to grow rapidly. We're going to have a story about that later. Uh, and that's that's a great thing um, because, you know, a two-wheeled EV, what is it, like the equivalent of 10 gas cars or something, you know, pollution-wise? It's just it's incredible. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, uh, it's going to improve air quality. I can't wait. I, uh, you know, I, my main reason for living is to see cleaner air in Beijing and uh, Delhi and places like that. And uh, I believe that EV prices will not come down very much this year. It doesn't look like they will because of the uh, supply no. demand issues. And I think we'll have some progress. Uh, this is my optimism here that we'll have some progress on the reliability of EV chargers. That you know they're getting too much shame these companies uh, for having crappy things and they're working hard to address it from reports that I've heard. So that's my predictions for 2023. Uh, okay, so I want to move on to a story here about Apple. And this was a thing that first came up in 2017. So uh, Apple started a data center in Denmark back in 2017 and they talked about using waste heat from the data center to, to heat the town that this was nearby. So in this Danish town, they have um, district heating, which is not a common thing around here. Uh, more common, I believe, in Europe, where each home doesn't have its own furnace. There's a district heating thing, and, and uh, hot water is piped through the town uh, to heat the town. So back in 2017, Apple talked about using the waste heat from their new data center to uh, basically preheat the water that goes into this town's district heating to basically save energy as you then kind of heat up the water. Uh, for some reason, they didn't end up doing it. But what happened since then is that Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. And this has sped up a lot of, you know, clean energy initiatives. And in this particular case, you know, the cost of energy has gone way up in Europe. So this is the thing that may actually 
get this project going now. It's more economically feasible now that um, the price of energy is uh, higher. So the idea with this system is that Apple's water would be about 30 Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit. And then that goes into the... That's perfect um, pool water, by the way. Perfect. perfect pool water. But it's got to get up to 50 Celsius or 122 Fahrenheit to go into the district heating system. So, you know, basically for it's free energy. You know, they can get the water up to 30 Celsius um, with just the waste heat from this data center. Because, of course, yeah, data centers create a, a lot of heat, all those processors running. And uh, so, yeah, I think... Um, I, it still hasn't happened, but there is some movement to actually uh, get this going this year. Maybe I should do crypto mining to heat my swimming pool. You know, set up <laughs> yeah. a data center in my house and, and run a loop out to the pool. Warm and, up the uh, swimming pool. Maybe I could use it year round. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. You know, they have um, uh, sometimes sidewalks and streets in uh, Nordic countries. There's some examples that they've actually run, you know, geothermal loops through them. And, and that just seems like heaven to me as far as yeah. the northern climate no. goes. You, I, I would love to have like a heated driveway or a heated sidewalk going up to my house. We oh, always have yeah. problems with, it's on the north side and, and um, I don't know, our sidewalk is impossible to, to keep from getting icy. I so, like think a, I saw pads at Costco, like on a Costco yeah, you website. Can get, Heater pads or even pads you can put on steps that will just melt the snow for yeah, you. Well, there you go. Another way to spend more electricity. It's mm -hmm. coming up with a lot of ways. If our cell phones, laptops, and electric cars weren't enough and heat pumps, uh, there's uh, ways of blowing through more electricity. I don't know. I, I think I, I think you're going to need more solar panels, Brian. I think you're going to need to build, buy the house next door and put solar panels on them or just tear it down and just put your own solar farm next door. Which I don't, I don't, you know, th encourage you not to do. Uh, Uganda. This is from Electric. Uganda, where President Yawari Kajuja, I cannot pronounce Uganda names. Well, let's call him Yo Yawari. Yawari. Sure. Kajuta. Kazuntite. Uh, no, he's got a last name. That was his middle name. Must have. <laughs> okay. The president of Uganda has made the announcement during his year-end national address that he will get this. Uh, allow people to trade in their combustion two-wheeler for an electric two-wheeler. Got a motorcycle, gas motorcycle, you can trade it in for an electric motorcycle. And for free. Free. Wow. How does he wow. do it? He's crazy. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Uh, no, well, I guess what he's doing is, is in, in getting the investors, uh, private sector investors, who will offer the, um, you know, battery swapping and charging services to people um, involved, and they're going to pay for these uh, bikes, and they're going to, uh, yeah, Uganda is right on the equator, and it's a landlocked country in, in Africa, and, you know, it's, it's just amazing that they are doing this, because, uh, you know, you, you think of Africa as, okay, we'll just let them be, they're behind, uh, we're not going to do... Um, pressure them to get on board, but they're coming up with very innovative and uh, progressive uh, ideas like this. So those investors will reportedly be granted licenses to operate charging and battery swap stations, according to Electric, which would be used to recoup their investment. The electric motorcycles will be domestically produced in Ugandan um, factories, and they'll generally retail for about uh, $1,350 US, $1,350 US equivalent. Uh, they're commonly used by something called boda bodas, which are motorcycle taxis that are quite popular in much of Africa. Didn't know that. Very naive about some parts of the world, I'm ashamed to uh -huh. say. Um, apparently, when you go out to dinner or do something with some friends, you don't hire, you know, get a Uber or a taxi. You get a one of these motorcycle taxis, hop on the back, and yeah. some guy drives you at high speeds through uh, reckless traffic, and you get to where you want to go. Um yeah, so I guess, I think one, you know, Uber actually owns one of these services in Uganda, so you can get a an Uber that is a motorcycle driver, essentially. Um, so, yeah, this is going to help support independent motorcycle taxi operators because they'll have lower operating costs. 
60% cheaper to operate than the current ones because they don't take fuel. Uh, charging the motorbike takes a small fraction. They don't have a lot of serviceable parts like motorcycles do. And the operator gets a lot more money. And money makes the world go around. And money is making the clean energy revolution go around. No, and there was a story about Hertz this week. Hertz famously ordered a bunch of Teslas and other electric vehicles for their car rental feet. Uh, fleet, and they are finding out that um, it's totally working. Like the maintenance costs are much lower, and uh, they're basically making more money as they move to electric vehicles. It's time for a clean energy show weather fact. The first one on the show. <laughs> the hottest months in Uganda are January and February, when the average daytime range is 24 to 33 Celsius, or 75 Fahrenheit to 91 Fahrenheit. Yeah, that seems quite comfortable to me. Why aren't we in Uganda? It's not bad. Mm. I wouldn't have an, I would need a heater in Uganda for my car, electric car. And it peaks up <laughs> to 40 degrees Celsius or 104 in the far north. Um, seems quite pleasant to me. Uganda. Mm -hmm. If anyone's listening in Uganda, send us a, an email, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com, because we're number one in where? Macedonia. Shout out to Macedonia, where we're number one if in our, it's the first time we've ever gone to the number one position. Yeah, uh, if there is anyone listening in Macedonia, please drop us a line, because apparently uh, we're doing well there. And if so, why? Because <laughs> I'd like to know. Yeah, it's time for the Tweet of the Week. This is from BYD, Build Your Dreams. This is the Chinese uh, motor company that is going hard on EVs. This is the company that Warren Buffett invested in in like 2006 or eight, early on, very early on. He saw the the potential, and they put out a tweet that said 2022 total sales were 1.8 million electric vehicles and PHEVs, plug-in hybrid, sold. So the year-on-year -year growth was 152 uh, percent for electric vehicles. That is pretty darn good. But anyway, here's the deal. Here's the th the the juice here. From the first EV and PHEV sold that they had to their 1 million mark, it took 13 years. Mm -hmm. To get from 1 million to 2 million, it took one year. Wow. To get from 2 million to 3 million, it took six months. So stay tuned. That's what I'm saying. Right. Stay tuned. Yeah. Hey. It's time to end the show with our lightning round, a fast-paced look at the week in clean energy and climate news. Brian, put your feet on the ground. It's a fat one this week. It's a big one, big one, big one, big, biggest lightning round in months. Uh, Hyundai will sell only electric cars in Norway. We covered that. The U.S. Army is testing a new flow battery from Lockheed Martin. So, yeah, the U.S. Army is getting in on clean energy these days. Yeah. And a flow They've battery. Done quite a few things that way, yeah. You know, a flow battery is um, very interesting. Look it up if you you want to know more. They're not dangerous either. This is for grid storage, so it can be uh, a very interesting battery for grid storage. Maybe that's something to invest in. The Yukon in Canada's northern uh, territory, their energy branch is offering a seventy five percent rebate for medium and heavy duty uh, zero emission vehicles like you know, electric vehicles, in exchange for participation in a two-year pilot program to study their performance in the cold weather, I'm guessing. Why else would you study their performance? Yukon's up north, ostensibly colder than we are, but also less populated, so I'm not counting them, because, you know. Yeah, that's a massive 75% rebate. That could be huge. I would imagine uh, that'll sell out quick. So if you're in the Yukon, get on that. Yeah, or James, move to the Yukon. Maybe that's how you can get a vehicle. It'd have to be a big one. But maybe I could afford a big one. Maybe I could get, uh, what could I get? Uh, one of those uh, Amazon delivery vans. They're very cool. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I saw a review of them. And they're, they're interesting in the technology they made uh, to make the driver's life a little bit better. Um, yeah, Hertz, as you were saying, discovered that electric vehicles are between 50 to 60% cheaper to maintain than gasoline powered cars. And guess what? Their power, their profits rather, are through the roof now. They're really yeah. high. And <laughs> ding, 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 the bell has gone off and it's going to be a lot more of that going on. Oh, yes, fast fact. A soccer superstar, you know, Pele. You've heard of him, yeah. he passed away. 
Well, he was given the Earth Day Award in 1993. I bet you didn't know that. He was no, very much an environmentalist, the world's greatest soccer player of all time. Yeah. Um, from Brazil, was an environmentalist. And unfortunately, many people who have controlled that country since have not really taken care of the Amazon. Tesla makes China boss the highest profile executive after Musk. So they've taken one of their executives from China, who is, you know, the China's plant is doing very well and moved him to North America, assumably so Musk can um, do Musk things. What do you think about that? Any thoughts as an investor? As no, it's interesting. Tom Zhu is the guy's name, and he's done very well in China. So, yeah, they're just giving him uh, bigger jobs with the company. A New York rideshare company could make $15,000 per car over a decade of storing power during off-peak hours and selling it at peak hours. So what you have here is a car share company that has a fleet of vehicles that are EVs, and they've got an arrangement to sell power back to the grid when the grid needs it, and they think that they're going to make $15,000. Boom! Economics. I'm not mm -hmm. an economics genius, Brian. I'm not a genius at anything, but I'm telling you, Money makes the world go around, and money is going to move everything we talk about incredibly fast once people start catching on, particularly people who listen to our show. Solar panel prices are falling in China, and it will soon affect world markets. You may recall that solar panel prices were a bit up last year, whereas they've been falling for, well, since forever, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. But because of uh, supply chain issues, they, yeah, but now... The silicon price uh, is down, and so is the Chinese prices. Good, good news, though. Mm -hmm. As stated before the show, Los Angeles will require all new buildings to be electric only in 2023. Induction co uh, cooktops instead of gas stoves. Uh, have you moved at all in your induction? No, still no. working on that. Jesus, Brian. It's not like you're retired. Come on. You've got time. You've got time to do this. Heat pumps instead of traditional heat and air conditioning. But also, no fireplaces. This is something I didn't know. No fireplaces or outdoor fire pits will be allowed. So basically, you can't burn natural gas. Uh, I wanted to point out that there's a Hyundai dealership in Vancouver, Canada, putting a $22,000 markup on the Ionic 5, pushing the price from $48,000 Canadian to a cool $70,000. And dealerships, evil. Yeah. China has Why? lost its first hydrogen-powered high-speed train. The first high-speed train that is powered by hydrogen fuel cells in all of Asia. It has a 600-kilometer range, which is, you know, you can get a car that does that. But, I mean, a train is a different thing, really. Uh, top speed, 160 kilometers an hour. And by the way, <laughs> speaking of 160 kilometers an hour, um, I saw somebody uh, at... Uh, one of the YouTube channels that does car reviews, they took, they bought an old Leaf, basically in the UK, like the the guy in Denver bought the oldest Leaf, the cheapest Leaf he could buy, and they drove it at a hundred miles an hour with the battery just about dead to see how far the range could be, and it was like, and they all took bets. It was like twenty three miles, or I don't know, thirty five kilometers, or something like that when you drove it at its maximum speed. And the speed they got was higher than what they thought. So it was 160 kilometers an hour. So to see my little car do that, which I would never do, yeah, the battery yeah. got hot. And it also basically said they had no range left halfway through. And they actually got a lot of driving before it actually died. So, yeah. Hmm. I don't think I've come close to, you know, killing my car. Germany has ended its dependence on Russian energy since August 11th. No coal has been imported. Natural gas imports have been reduced from 55% at the beginning of 2022 to zero. Oil imports dropped from 40% to under 20% and will be phased out by the end of the year. Thank you, Mr. Vladimir Putin, you jackass. Yeah, accelerating clean energy uh, was never his goal. But yeah, and there was a shipment of liquefied natural gas from the U.S. has arrived in Germany. That's part of this solution to uh, give them other alternatives to Russian energy. Nothing, nothing is going right for Putin. <laughs> Sorry. Sad trombone. I, I, have, I have to. I have to, whenever possible. Delhi has proposed to significantly increase its solar power target for 2025. Now, just two years away. Can you believe that? 2025 used to be a half decade away when we started the show, <laughs> and now it's around the corner. 
According to media reports, the government has issued a draft solar policy that targets, um, you know, six gigawatts, which is like six nuclear power plants worth of uh, solar power capacity by the end of 2025. With this, the government hopes to increase the share of solar power in Delhi's total power consumption from 9% right now to 25%. So that is, you know, it's huge. Everything we talk about, huge. So there's nothing small that we talk about. These things that are going on are just uh, happening so fast. CS Fast Fact for you, Brian Wired Magazine says that heated seats take just 560 meters of range for each hour of use. So I did the math on that, and I came up with 31 days for the average uh, 420-kilometer car. 31 days of seat heat. So people say if you break mm -hmm. down in a blizzard an electric car, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Opposite is true. Often the opposite is true, and the opposite is true yeah. here. If you're low on battery juice, just put on the heated seats, and that'll last you for days. And it will keep your ass warm and your blood warm, and you will not get hypothermia. So 31 days of that. Uh, wow. Try that with a, with a gas car. You have to run the engine for the heated seats to work for more than an hour or two. So, yeah, bonus fact, uh, Brian. Saab introduced the first actual heated seat in guess what year? I was five years old, 1972. Wow. What, what a great groundbreaking uh, invention that is. And <laughs> finally this week, and Brian, I ask you to raise the fainting guards on your chair as a precaution so you don't fall over. Heat pumps outsold fossil fuel furnaces this year in the United States. Can you believe that? That's, That's incredible. remarkable. That's our time for this week. Uh, Brian is still upright. We like to hear from you. We'd love to hear from you. We thrive on your feedback. Contact us, Clean Energy Show at gmail.com or on Twitter, TikTok, and social media. Our handle is Clean Energy Pod. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel as well for special features. You can leave us a actual voicemail. Uh, one of the great things that we love, speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. I have to once again this week say special thanks to those who have donated to the podcast by using the donate button on the show notes because uh, you guys are just knocking us over. We're just so thankful for your generosity. And, you know, whenever somebody gives a little or a lot, they always say nice things about us. I never mention nice. that. But, you yeah. know, those words, they count too. We, it, keeps, it keeps the wind in our sails. I I should give you money just so I can insult you. I'd prefer that. <laughs> yes, you could also give money to insult us. <laughs> we continue to be humbled by your generosity anyway, guys. So thanks for uh, your kind words that you sent along with your donations. And if you're new to the show, uh, remember to subscribe on your podcast app. And if you're on YouTube, then by God, you know, hit the subscribe button there and all that. We'll see you next week for another Clean Energy Show. See you next week.